this uh, prime time uh, session is on early lung cancer and i think all of us know why it is so important to focus on this uh, aspect of lung cancer uh, because lung cancer has now become a potentially curable or at least a disease that uh, can be converted into a long term uh, effective and uh, meaningful survival and that is especially true for early lung cancer the only challenge is to ensure that the patients are diagnosed in early lung uh, stage and not at a later stage so i think uh, that is why it is exceedingly important for us to focus on early lung cancer uh, can i have the first slide please so our first speaker on pre operative staging ebus for all is none other than the renowned dr deepak talwar the senior consultant and chairman metro center for respiratory diseases and this has been established way back in 1999 it has been doing exemplary work 30 years of superb experience and one of the important uh, feathers in dr deepak's uh, cap is that he features in the umka book and of record I don't want to go through his extensive list of awards honors and fellowships because then I would be imposing on his time so without uh, wasting much time uh, over to you sir Dr Deepak Talwar thank you Dr Purvesh and thank you for giving me an opportunity to discuss today on this uh, important topic and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, pre operative staging and uh, ebus uh i think uh, the best time to start uh, the topic is that uh, we got ebus in 2011 so it's been 10 years so we have been uh, celebrating one decade of ebus with us and uh, the 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 topic is really intriguing because this is something which we always wanted ever since we got ebus to do pre operative staging for these patients which uh, come up with lung cancer and they are in the operable stage where we really want to look forward to it for scope of discussion for me today is basically focused on early lung cancer as dr purvesh said it's prime time for early lung cancer because this is where we really need to focus and this is where we really need to see what we can do and here the ebus is in pre operative staging and uh, do we need it in all of them and basically what we are looking for is we are establishing the role in n0 or n1 and trying to confirm the other end stations which perhaps may be even relevant in india where tuberculosis is rampant so we do uh, pre operative or per operative staging and we are going to talk about pre operative and in pre operative ebus is one of the endoscopic method of doing staging and it can be combined with with or without eus uh, but there are others like standard which is anatomic like mediastinoscopy metabolic which is like pet scans and of course surgical which are uh, uh, there are two or three methods of them which can be done with a vats or which can be done with the 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 vats mediastinoscopy these are the various nodal stations which uh, people know about it but the primary idea of staging at this point of time is uh, to be sure that are we going to upstage to a higher end that is from n1 to n2 or n0 to n2 which is going to be of immense importance in taking therapeutic decisions regarding the treatment of lung cancer and uh, of course there is increased number of metastatic involved nodal stations which can be picked up like from single level to multiple level n2 disease which again makes sense again uh, to take a good therapeutic decision for the management of lung cancer it's not a unusual thing to see that uh, most of the lung cancer what we see in practice is in stage 3b or stage 4 and in fact we published in 2013 that uh, almost 90% of lung cancer what we see is in late stage so our early lung cancer is something which we do not want to miss and the gold standard remains the mediastinoscopy which can be like uh, there are there are methods like you can do it by vats or you can do uh, video assisted mediastinoscopy and uh, these have got a fairly good amount of sensitivity specificity and a positive predictive values uh, however they do have a complication rates which is about 2% and of course there are certain things which cannot be assessed with the vats also and of course it's a, since it's an invasive technique Uh, we would always be looking for the uh, for the for the less invasive or rather uh, relatively non invasive ways of staging 
The, the reason why we need to do is because any lymph node which is of short axis more than or equal to 10 millimeter on a CT scan is considered as abnormal. And then uh, we need to sample it because uh, the sensitivity, although is about 70% uh, to 85%, whether we are talking about PET CT or a CT, but then the sensitive, uh, the specificity is low here. So to look for non-invasive methods of staging, we have EBUS staging. And if we try to look at it, how does it fare with a with gold standard of uh, media stenoscopy? So this is a prospective control trial of uh, EBUS uh, compared with the media stenoscopy for media stenal lymph node staging in lung cancer. And if you look at it, the sensitivity of media stenoscopy is 81% with a vis EBUS 79%. Negative predictive value is nearly the same, 91 and 90% for EBUS. And of course, if you look at the diagnostic accuracy, it's the same, 93%. So there, the, the, the EBUS staging very closely follow the media stenoscopy, which is considered as a gold standard. And of course, the complications of EBUS TBNA are practically negligible with a vis media stenoscopy, which in large uh, uh, studies and uh, meta-analysis shows the complication rates of 2.6%. And uh, positive predictive value is nearly 100% with specificity, uh, a good, very good specificity in both the procedures, whether we do media stenoscopy or EBUS. Then comes the question, you know, most of the times the staging is being done by the PET CT or a CT scan. And if you look at the sensitivity and specificity of these tests, these are, these are fairly, uh, you know, uh, uh, heterogeneous, where a CT scan will have a sensitivity of 76%, 80% for a PET scan, but EBUS has sensitivity of more than 92%. On the other hand, if you look at the specificity, CT scan has 55%, PET scan or C, uh, PET CT scan has 70%, EBUS has 100%. So if we overall look at the diagnostic accuracy of uh, these procedures, of course, the CT and PET CT are completely non-invasive in comparison to minimally invasive, which is EBUS. The di diagnostic accuracy is 60% with CT scan, 72.5% with PET CT scans, and 98% EBUS. So high sensitivity as well as high specificity which is nearly 100% for mediastinal and hilar lymph node stages in patient with lung cancer makes its way that EBUS will soon will become one of the most important minimally invasive procedure for the staging in patients with lung cancer. There has, there has been a word of caution for PET scan people who believe on PET scan in staging because in Asian countries, FDG uptake is not only because of malignant nodes, but many a times you will be seeing surprises where the tuberculosis will be encountered and it makes the patient actually uh, not uh, downsize their stage rather than upstaging them. What about doing uh, when the, there is a normal mediastinum on imaging. So if the, if the CT or the C, PET CTs uh, do not show any intake, N0, would you like to do a EBUS staging in those also? And it has been seen that you can pick up and most frequently EBUS picked up lymph nodes, which are normal on imaging R4, R, that is the right paratracheal and subcarinal, that is station seven. And it is more commonly seen in women with adenocarcinoma, with the occult uh, lymph nodes being present in them. Another study which has come from ATS is that uh, EBUS in normal mediastinum will pick up occult metastasis in about 22% of patients and the sensitivity and negative predictive value of performing EBUS when there is a normal mediastinum is 60% and 94%, 93.4%. So you can see that there is a, there's a lot of role in performing EBUS, even if it is a normal looking mediastinum on a CT scan or a PET CT scan. Uh, role in uh, N0 and N1 disease, th this is a systematic review and meta-analysis, and uh, it does reduce the post-operative upstaging and uh, sensitivity or, uh, is, uh, for the uh, occult mediastinal metastasis seems to be lower than selective sampling of pathological lymph nodes. And of course, uh, verification of negative mediastinos, uh, negative results on EBUS may require actually mediastinoscopy in few cases. In N2, N3, N3 stage, uh, it is again, uh, it is showing that sensitivity was even higher, almost about 94%. And particularly if the patients are selected on the basis of CT or a PET CT results. 
Hence, pet positivity increases the chances of EBUS positivity, but that is more towards the late stages and what we are focusing today is on early stage. Uh, EBUS also is used for restaging in lung cancer and particularly 3A and 2 uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And there is a meta-analysis of 10 studies showing pool sensitivity and specificity of 67 and 99% respectively. However, EBUS also has limitations. Sometimes you cannot get access to prevascular nodes or subaortic or paraortic lymph nodes or paraesophageal or pulmonary ligament lymph nodes. And some of these lymph nodes, however, can be uh, reached with the, have, with, the, with, the, uh, with, uh, with the availability of a scope into the esophagus, which is the EUS. So adding EUS to EBUS in lung cancer staging adds significantly. And if you are doing EBUS and you add ES, uh, EUS, then you add uh, about 10% more cases. And if you do to EBUS, which is added to EUS, it is significantly more. So what it means is clearly that EBUS is a preferred one. EUS is not the preferred one. But if you use both of them together, you tend to get many more patients, in fact, uh, positive. And uh, it's, a, it's a better modality to combine together as it, uh, it significantly improves the sensitivity of uh, detecting mediastinal lymph node metastasis, reducing the need for surgical staging procedures. So these are the various lymph node stations which can be uh, actually targeted by, by the various methods which we have. And you can see that we have a lot of them on EBUS as well as EUS. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you do these two procedures together, practically almost a large number of or almost all are actually achievable with the help of this. So what it means is if you combine EBUS with EUS, it is actually almost equal to uh, or what we call as, as a medical uh, uh, mediastinoscopy. Looking at the other aspect that um, which one is, uh, you know, uh, two procedures, you require two scopes and the uh, patient needs to go to two uh, different uh, specialities. So a pulmonologist tried to do the EBUS, who are doing EBUS, they try to use the same scope to do EUS to sample these lymph nodes, which are not accessible with the help of EBUS. So that is called EUSB. So what it means is it is an ultrasonography, which is through the esophagus, but the scope used is a bronchoscope here. So uh, the, the results did show that when you, when you add this uh, uh, EBUS to EUS, whether you use EUS scope or you use a uh, EBUS scope, it makes no difference because both of them are not only safe and very effective, they have a, a very high sensitivity as well as the negative predictive values. So uh, which type of EBUS to be used? So we have a routine like we go and say it's a garden variety, you know, patient is posted, but this is mostly for mediastinal lymphadenopathy. It is not for lung cancer staging. If we really need to do, either we have a targeted EBUS, which is called hit and run method. You look at the lymph nodes on a PET scan or a CT scan, and those who have more than 10 millimeter in size, you, you all actually hit them with the EBUS scope. Other is the systematic approach of EBUS. Based on PET, CT, as well as EBUS, all lymph nodes are routinely sampled, particularly 4R and 4L, which is right paratracheal and left paratracheal, as well as subcarinal. And even if on EBUS, the short axis is eight millimeter or more, they are all targeted. So this was one study score study, which tried to look into the information and they found that the combined approach which uh, used uh, this method, which is EUSB and EBUS in systematic manner, it is meaningful clinical staging information obtained in an additional 10% of patients in these, uh, these type of patients. So this is like one equipment which is trying to do both the things one time, no extra cost to the patient. And of course, one, one operator, one, one, one sitting. And uh, in these patients, which are suspected cases of non-small cell lung cancer, systematic staging strategy, when it is combined with EBUS, with EUSB, it results in increased sensitivity for detecting mediastinal lymph node metastasis versus targeted EBUS alone. So if we, if we have a facility and if we have a technical expertise of doing this, then perhaps this will be one method by which we would like to uh, maximally uh, utilize the output as well as uh, make, uh, use this uh, um, uh, sample this uh, 
as many as uh, lymph node stations as possible or required in all the cases. So after if the EBUS comes out to be negative, do you need to confirm it with the media stinoscopy, which is considered as a gold standard? It's a clinical disease. False negatives can be seen. And, uh, but in, you can omit that because of the time as well as if the technical expertise is not available because you need to reduce the extra waiting time in which the staging will become, uh, the, the patient's lung cancer may become upstaged or general anesthesia as well as hospitalization. And uh, of course, uh, to conclude, whatever I have said about EBUS in staging of early lung cancer is we, we do understand that accurate preoperative uh, nodal staging of non-small cell lung cancer is crucial for therapeutic decisions. CT and PET CT scans are very commonly used, but have shortcomings in the diagnostic accuracy. Because of this, the lymph node abnormalities require a gold standard that is the tissue sampling and the preferred method for the further tissue uh, in, uh, confirmation is by using a minimal invasive sampling technique would be EBUS and if preferably possible to combine it with EUS, which can be EUSB also to not only decrease the patient's cost, but also the time and also the uh, visit to the two different specialists. So early lung cancer at the moment, the first procedure where you need to stage them and to confirm the tissue uh, metastasis, uh, it would be definitely a uh, EBUS, as, and as I said that, but also very relevant in India, even in N2 disease, or perhaps when, when otherwise this is declared inoperable on the basis of PET CT scans or CT scans, would be to sample the NIF nodes. That's once in a while you get a surprise when it comes out to be tuberculosis rather than a metastasis. This has been observation from various Asian studies. And this I would like to end by telling that in the last one decade of doing the EBUS for us, it's been almost 3000 plus EBUS which we have done. If we look at it, how many we have used for a systematic sampling for early lung cancer, the number is 0.5% only, which shows that this is an opportunity which is missed most frequently. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, your final message was awesome. And without much wasting much time, we need to rush to Dr. Avind Kumar, who is a dear friend of mine also. He is chairman Institute of Chest Surgery and Chest Onco Surgery, as well as Lung Transplantation Medanta, New Delhi. He and his team has performed more than 50,000 thoracic and 8,000 minimally invasive surgery. And how can I forget that he is recipient of the BC Roy Award as well. Over to you, sir. Uh, Dr. Parikh good, and all the delegates, good evening and uh, sincere thanks to Dr. Parikh for this wonderful opportunity and uh, uh, Dr. Talwar really enjoyed uh, your lecture. Uh, my task uh, in the next 10 minutes is to just take you through a surgeon's perspective on resectable lung cancer. Now there has been a serious increase in the incidence of lung cancer and this was one ICMR data which we came across, which actually reported more increase in Chennai and Bangalore than in Delhi, which I found very surprising. Uh, there are four, uh, since it's just a 10 minutes, so I'll restrict myself uh, not to go into details, rather what as an oncologist, what are the main things that we need to focus on when we are confronted with somebody who may be having a lung cancer. So first step is when you see a abnormality on the chest X-ray, is that really a lung cancer? That's the first thing that you need to confirm the tissue diagnosis. Obviously, there is no uh, uh, opinion or surgery without a tissue diagnosis. Uh, many times these days, it's a surprising thing which is happening is that patients are saying, is there any other diagnosis? So if it's a 60-year-old person, chronic smoker, they would ask, does it, uh, could it be anything else? And if you say no, most unlikely, then they'll say why tissue diagnosis somehow. So the message is no, tissue is an important issue. And obviously you would never ever take anybody for a second without a tissue diagnosis. The second important thing is the staging. Which stage is it? And as Dr. Talwar very elegantly pointed out, 
a combination of a PET scan, uh, then EBUS, EUS, and mediastinus plus minus mediastinoscopy. These are the things which allow us, and also a diagnostic thoracoscopy, which we have made it a routine now in all our cases, because one to 2% of the patients, you may find some unsuspected pleural metastasis. So these are the things. Next thing is, is this tumor resectable? Can I resect this tumor? So resectability is not a word combined with the patient. It relates to the tumor. And what actually relates to the patient is, is he fit for surgery? So there is often a confusion between resectability and fitness for surgery. So resectability refers to a uh, tumor and suitability refers to patient. So we have from just radiography to cytology, HRCT, PET, bone scan, MRI, various uh, uh, non-invasive, and then bronchoscopy, autofluorescence, TBNA, EBUS, mediastinoscopy, mediastinotomy, and thoracoscopy. This is the range of procedures that are available for us to diagnose. And then the general stage which is followed, these are various guidelines which are available. I have put them there that there has to be a proper intrathoracic as well as extrathoracic imaging a staging. You cannot take up a patient for surgical management or for that matter, any management today without a proper staging. And assessment of mediastinum is a very, very important thing for a surgeon today, where definitely at one time, mediastinoscopy was a standard of care. But today, EBUS, and a combination of EUS also, as Dr. Palwar explained, what is called medis med medical mediastinoscopy is uh, almost replaced the mediastinoscopy, plus minus the possibility of doing an intraoperative mediastinoscopic staging uh, in a EBUS negative patient if the suspicion is very, very high. So this is very important and needs to be done in a very diligent manner. And Sometimes uh, you actually need to combine it with thoracoscopy also. Then finally, I mean, after you have confirmed the diagnosis, you've staged the disease, you look at the resectability, and you do a workup, comes the role of uh, assessment of the patient. Uh, surgical resection is obviously for uh, stage clinical stage one and two non-small cell cancers. Um, for patients with clinical stage one and two and who are medically fit, it is recommended that this actually should be seen. Now, this is important because numerous places I'm now nowadays experiencing that the patients are actually evaluated not by a combined team, but maybe by just a medical oncologist, sometimes only a pulmonologist, sometimes only a radiation oncologist. And the resectability issue is decided based on their perception of the team. So this need, this myth, this wrong practice needs to be broken. It's a teamwork. And when you do a multidisciplinary approach uh, evaluation, as is very rightly the, uh, the topic of the panel discussion 15 minutes later. So uh, a, a medical oncologist, a pulmonologist, a surgeon, a radiation oncologist are an important core important. In fact, I would add, and anesthetist also, they are an important part of the five pillars of MDT. And decision about resectability should actually be taken by surgeon. As I said, after you have looked at the resectability part, you have to look at the suitability of the patients. And therefore, a physiological evaluation prior to resectional surgery is very important. Elderly patients who are potential candidates for curative surgical resection should be fully evaluated regardless of age. Now, this age is another myth that I wish to bust, that many times we have this tendency of taking a very nihilistic approach to patients who are maybe 65 plus, 70 plus. We'll say, oh, 70, he can't be uh, a fit for surgery. So a 75-year-old person who is able to climb three or four flights of stairs for me, is a far more fit person for surgery than a, maybe a 45-year-old person who comes to my OPD on a wheelchair. So age should not be influencing our decision-making. We should be looking for their physiological age. So a proper physiological assessment is the answer and not getting discouraged by the age. Patients have a, who have a 
increased perioperative cardiovascular cyst, a risk of preoperative cardiological evaluation should be done. Both FEV1 and DL socio should be measured in all patients and in case uh, required, then postoperative predicted FEV1 and PPO uh, DLCO should be calculated when it's indicated. So if both PPO, FEV1 and PPO DLCO are more than 60% of predicted, there are no further tests recommended. But if they are less than 60%, but more than 30% predicted, a low technology exercise test like a stair climbing test or shuttle walk test is recommended. And if either PPO is less than 30% or a PPO DLCO is less than 30%, then a formal cardiopulmonary exercise test with VO2 max is recommended. So it's a, a step-wise approach to evaluating a patient. You evaluate a patient and depending on which risk category he's falling into, you go further to evaluate the, the, the status of the patient. Now, if VO2 max is less than 10 ml per kg per minute or less than 35% predicted, it is recommended that the patient be counseled about minimal invasive surgery, a sublobar resection, or they should be operated. They should be offered a non-operative treatment option for that. But if both are more than 60% of the predicted, then no further tests are recommended. Now, the main issue which I want to convey regarding surgery. Surgery, of course, there are two issues. One is about the margin and other is about the method of surgery. So clear margins are a must. If you feel that you are not going to be able to get a clear margin and R0 resection. Lung cancer is one cancer where a, a debulking, as the term is used, should never be used. So standard patients, standard approach, one and two are generally offered surgery with stage two getting post-op chemo and some stage three can be offered surgery, usually after chemo radiotherapy or chemotherapy. And the rare stage four patients who can sometimes be offered surgery are the ones with solitary brain metastasis. Now, sampling or dissection of lymph nodes is an important step. So stage one, there has to be a systematic lymph node sampling or dissection. There should be no selective or no sampling should not be done. It should be systematic lymph node dilection. And as we proceed further, this is done. The kind of resections vary from uh, anatomic lobectomy, pneumonectomy, sleeve lobectomy, segmentectomy, wedge resections to sometimes even sleeve pneumonectomy. The issue which is actually a hot topic these days is whether it should be open surgery, VAT surgery, or robotic assisted surgery. So open surgery would give you wonderful exposure, but will give you all these disadvantages of open surgery. But when you go to VAT surgery, you have all the advantages of because of the avoidance of rib spreading, so less pain, less requirement for anatomic. This is an important slide. What is a typical vas lobectomy? Because there are various versions of this lobectomy which are common. So it should be number one, an anatomic lobectomy. There should be individual hilar ligation. Uh, if you have a mass ligation, this cannot be called a proper vas lobectomy. There should be complete hilar lymph node dissection. Incision size should be less than seven centimeters, and there should be no rib spreading, no use of rib refractors. Now, conventional VATS has 2D vision, instruments are rigid, and there is poor ergonomics, longer learning curve. So therefore, this role of robotic has come where you have the, 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 the uh, console and the robot where you carry out the procedures. It gives you 3D vision, and the instruments are far more versatile than the other method. And therefore, it has all the advantages of the VATS approach, but the disadvantages of the VATS approach are released. So what is the current uh, status? Current status is that VATS is now accepted. As far as the trials are concerned, the ultimate measure of success in cancer surgery is long-term survival. So there are now enough data available, which has shown that there is comparable or sometimes better long-term survival with bad slobectomies. Uh, reported local regional recurrence rates are in the range of 5 to 10%, and it provides lymph node clearance as good as open surgery. So this is versus VATS versus open. When you come to VATS versus robotic, robotic is gaining a wider acceptance. There are reports that we have better lymph node yield, better clearance of lymph nodes, but till date, there is no data, hard data available, which definitely proves its superiority 
over the VAT. So that is an area which continues to be an area of concern. Uh, I think since time is up, I will stop here and I'll be happy to take any questions, if any. Dr. Parikh. Thank you very much, Dr. Arvind Kumar. I know that you have to rush to another uh, webinar, so we will uh, take the, your questions in the panel discussion and Dr. Bilal may be able to answer them. Yeah, Dr. Parikh, Dr. Bilal is already joined in. He's yes, there, yes. So he'll be uh, uh, there in the panel discussion and he would be happy to answer. Awesome, awesome, awesome. great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much Thank for you. your... Uh, right. So we'll, we'll, we'll go on to the next speaker, Dr. Roy Herb. Can I have a slide please? Yes, perfect. Uh, Indian oncologists and pulmonologists are not unfamiliar with Dr. Roy Herb. He is a very popular uh, speaker. He has been, uh, we had the honor to have listened to him on several occasions. He's professor of medicine and pharmacology, chief of the medical oncology and associate director for translational research at the world renowned Yale School of Medicine and Yale Cancer Center. He was a recipient of the 2016 prestigious uh, Paul Bunn in, uh, Scientific Award given by the IASLC, which is very prestigious. He has been a co-leader for Battle 1 clinical trial program, co-lead for the subsequent Battle 2 program, and of course, a lot of other trials. So without uh, wasting much time, may I invite uh, Dr. Roy? to please uh, begin his uh, lecture. And we are all eagerly waiting to listen to you, sir. Thank you. If you could please put my slides up for me. Oh, hi, do you hear me? Yes, sir, they'll start your slides uh, soon. Within the process. Yeah, well, it, it's really an honor to be here. I, I wish I could be here in person uh, and all of us and hopefully things are are getting better. And um, it's my pleasure to be here and talk about new paradigms in the treatment of resected uh, EGFR mutant lung cancer. And uh, really what I wanna focus on is the ADORA trial. And this is really exciting. Um, we've only had these data uh, for about a year. It was um, actually less than a year ago that we first saw these data. And I don't know if I control the slides or I just say next slide. Um, so, you know, resectable disease is, is, is really uh, an important uh, aspect of lung cancer. Today's a focused surgical meeting, and we're talking about early stage disease. We know that lung cancer is the leading cause of death worldwide, more than 1.7 million deaths, um, you know, and, um, and more than breast, prostate, and colon combined. And uh, non-small cell, of course, is 85% of cases, and about 30%, you know, a little more, a little less, uh, of, of, of tumors are resectable at diagnosis. And, you know, I don't need to show a group like this, this, but you see stage 1B, 2 and 3A with different levels of spread. You know, these are, are either early local or regional uh, disease. How can we treat it uh, more effectively? Next slide, please. So here you can see that, you know, recurrence uh, rates are high. So um, adjuvant platinum-based therapy, uh, the medical oncologists like myself, you know, have worked on this for many years and Certainly, we know that the five-year overall survival benefit is real. There is a survival benefit to platinum therapy, but the hazard ratio is 0 0.89, disease-free survival 0 0.84. These are real benefits, and actually, across the population and with the absolute benefit being more in stage three than stage two than stage one, we're using these measures quite a bit. However, look at the bottom. Uh, here's the same slide I showed you now with recurrence rates. Stage 1B disease, five-year recurrence rate, 45%. Stage 2 disease, five-year, 62%. And stage 3, 76%. So I think we all realize, you know, that we need to do better. Next slide, please. So here you can see that there are not a lot of studies, uh, but enough that we can look at the prevalence of EGFR mutations um, in different stages. And here you have... Um, uh, the overall estimated prevalence of EGFR in Asia, about 30 to 40 percent. In Caucasian population, 10 to 20 percent. And if you look at the table on the right, you can see that from stage one, two, three, and four, it looks like the percentages of EGFR mutations are about the same. So there's not like more in stage four versus stage one or two. So 
if we had EGFRs and TKIs in the resectable setting, and we do, and you know you do too, uh, a similar proportion of patients may be able to benefit compared to the more advanced disease. So that's that's the goal here to bring these agents to the earliest stages of disease. So in the next slide, these are the data that was were presented at ASCO, and I'm just here on behalf of an entire team. These are just the steering committee, but um, our, our, our executive committee, myself, uh, a wonderful uh, Japanese surgeon, Masahiro Suboy, and Yi Lang Wu, medical oncologist from China. But this was a global study. Asimertinib is adjuvant therapy in 1B to 3A, EJ for our mutant positive lung cancer. On the next slide, you'll see here's the, uh, the trial design. I think many of you probably know this uh, by now. It was published in October in the New England Journal of Medicine. You can see patients on the left with completely resected stage 1B, 2, or 3A non-small cell, non cell lung cancer with or without adjuvant chemotherapy, a very important point. If patients were candidates for adjuvant chemotherapy and were willing to take it, they got it. So uh, the max interval between surgery and randomization differed. It was 10 weeks with no adjuvant chemotherapy and 26 weeks if they had three to four cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy. Patients had to be either 18 or 20 years old, depending on the country, a performance status of zero to one. They have to have non-squamous disease. Uh, There's only allowed non-squamous disease. That's of course where most of the EGFR mutations are. But now patients with either exon 19 deletion or exon 21 point mutation, LH58R, could get on this study. Brain imaging was done if not completed preoperatively Complete resection had to occur with an R0 resection negative margins. You see in the middle patients were stratified by stage, 1B versus 2 versus 3A. There were about equal numbers of each of the three of those uh, by the type of mutation, exon 19 or LH58R or a race, Asian versus non-Asian. And then they were randomized to osimertinib, 80 milligrams once daily or to placebo, one to one. It was a placebo controlled trial because there had been no standard of care in this area. A radiant trial had looked at uh, erlotinib, was negative. Uh, so there was no, you, no proven data to use an EGFR inhibitor in this setting. 682 patients globally. Planned treatment duration was for three years. Treatment continued until disease recurrence. Uh, treatment was completed or discontinuation criteria are met. Follow up until recurrence, week 12 and 24 then every 24 weeks to five years and then yearly, after recurrence every 24 weeks for five years and then yearly. The primary endpoint was disease-free survival by investigator assessment in stage two to three A patients designed for superiority under the assumed DFS hazard ratio of 0 0.70. It was looking for a 30% improvement. Secondary endpoints, DFS uh, in the overall population, uh, landmarks at two, three, four, and five years, of course, overall survival, safety, and quality of life. We did not expect these data last year. In fact, I would have thought it wouldn't have been until next year that the trial was going to unblind. But the data monitoring committee was doing a safety review last April 1st, and they noticed that there was a large uh, difference in efficacy. And uh, they petitioned to review a formal efficacy analysis, which was done. And this was allowed because all the patients had either had the asimertinib or the placebo at the time, for at least one year. So it was felt that uh, we could take a look at it and the results are shown on the next slide. So if, uh, well, uh, next slide, actually, um, I apologize. This is just the inclusion criteria shown one more time. I just wanna point one thing out here. I already went through this, but look at the bottom left inclusion criteria and an MRI or CT scan of the brain was done prior to surgery. So we did take a peek at the brain. Now, some people would say, well, everyone should have had an MRI. Perhaps in the best world, where every, resources are totally unlimited. But in a global study, about half the patients had an MRI and half had the CT of the brain, but all had some of imaging of the brain. And then you can see the exclusion criteria. A few things that I did not mention that I wanna point out, patients could not have had pre or post-operative radiotherapy. There was some concern uh, about you know, interstitial lung disease. That was a big issue until the lung art trial came out at ESMO. And, and now you know, it, it's not as much of an issue but you know, in some practices, people do use radiation, and I think you know, post uh, post this trial, that probably will be worked in in certain cases. Uh, otherwise, I think I've pretty much shown you all the exclusions. P 
patients could not have had a segment or a wedge. They had to have an R0 lobe, and uh, at least, and, and um, they, uh, there were some concerns always with these uh, EGFR inhibitors of QTC prolongation that was looked at, and of course, no history of ILD. So on the next slide, here's the, the baseline characteristics, and I won't belabor this. I'll let you all take a peek at the slide as, as I am. Um, pretty equal between isomertative and placebo, one to one. Um, uh, more women than men, uh, as you would expect, the EGFR mutations. You know, you have to find those 30% of patients worldwide, uh, 30, and those, those patients uh, with the mutations, 30, 20 to 30% in Asia, 10 to 15% in the US. You can, the thing that I note here is the, you know, of course, the median age is um, on the higher side. Smoking status, there were some uh, former smokers. Um, race, um, two thirds Asian. <coughs> Most of the patients had performance status one, uh, uh, zero. Uh, but there were some one. You can see the brain imaging, as I told you, MRI, CT, about equal um, uh, numbers. Uh, the staging, one to one to one, as I mentioned. Um, all these patients should have had adenocarcinoma. Some of them were probably NOS, not otherwise specified. A few more exon 19 deletions. And then look at the adjuvant chemotherapy. I've put a box around it, 60-40, yes, no. So um, most of the stage three and, and, and two had adjuvant, uh, the ones did not. I'll show you that in more granularity in a moment. But the important thing is equal. The randomization takes care of a lot, both in the adjuvant chemotherapy and also in the brain imaging. So if we go to the next slide, please. Well, here are the data. And I remember when I, I saw this, and as I say, it's just a little bit uh, less than a year ago. I said, wow. Um, of course, we expected this trial to be positive. It's a placebo-controlled trial, and you're using an EGFR inhibitor in patients with EGFR disease. But to this extent, look at the left, the primary population, stage 2 to 3A disease, hazard ratio 0 0.17, um, and you can see the, um, the p-value is less than 0 0.001, an 83% improvement. And then if you look at the right, when you add the 1B in, this is a secondary analysis, Remember, the 1Bs, half of them would do fine with nothing else. Uh, the hazard ratio only goes up a tad. The curves look almost the same to 0.2, 80% improvement. So these results exceeded expectations. Asimertinib, of course, is a third-generation EGFR TKI. It has high CNS penetration. It targets only the mutant EGFR receptor, meaning that there should be less diarrhea and rash. There is, but it's not perfect because there's still some bleeding and spillage to, to the, the wild type receptor, but still really uh, this, this is the top line result if you remember anything from today. Next slide. And uh, here we've just sort of put that in to remind me, but I just told you this really, really just uh, fantastic uh, decreases in, in risk of disease recurrence. Remember this is disease-free survival. This is an adjuvant trial uh, and we're waiting on overall survival. I'll show you a little bit about that in a second. Next slide. So here's the two-year disease-free survival was consistent across stages. So uh, stage 1B, stage 2, and stage 3, the two-year disease-free survival in 1B, the hazard ratio is 0.39, uh, 88 versus 71%. In stage 2, hazard ratio is 0.17, 91 versus 56%. And in stage 3, 88 versus 32%. So this is a two-year landmark. And um, the, the, these hazard ratios are uh, having worked in this field now for 25 years. You know, in the metastatic setting, if we had a hazard ratio of 0.8, we were happy in the old days. You know, again, earlier disease to have hazard ratios less than 0.2, uh, uh, just incredible. Next slide. Now, um, the forest plot gives us a chance to look at the, um, the, the, uh, the variables, uh, a number of variables, and look to see if any of them uh, uh, you know, uh, have any uh, effect on the result. So if you look at this forest plot, <clears throat> the one in the center, that's unity. Anything to the left favors astromertinib. Anything to the right favors placebo. You can see the hazard ratios um, you know, on the right uh, numerically, um, but with the black dots, that, that basically shows you where they fall in with the confidence intervals. And what do you see that overall, uh, I already went through that, but by sex, age, smoking history, race, stage, mutation status, or the presence or ag absence or adjuvant chemotherapy. Everything's to the left of one. Everything is favoring the asimertinib. It was um, a home run 
uh, every one of these uh, pre-specified variables favored the treatment arm. Uh, and I really want to just point out the adjuvant chemotherapy because that that certainly does come into play because you know um, it doesn't matter. Um, it, both groups uh, benefited. Next slide. Now everyone always asks about survival, and of course, uh, the ultimate goal of everything we do is survival. Though uh, disease-free survival and preventing that with morbidity, which I'll get to in a moment, certainly is pretty important too. Uh, it's too early to have survival. How this trial was early. The maturity is 5%. That means only 5% of patients died. Thank goodness. 3% um, uh, in the azimertinib arm and 7% in the placebo trial. This is an adjuvant trial. My, my friend Paul Bunn says you can probably do one or two adjuvant trials your whole career. They take a long time as an investigator, but that's good. Um, but look at the survival curves. The, the, the blue on top, the, the yellow is azimertinib. The yellow is the uh, placebo. Even at this early time, and I'm almost, uh, I almost took this out of the presentation, but it's in the paper in the supplemental, so it's in the uh, public domain, hazard ratio 0.4. It's a positive trend, still a lot of time to go. We'd probably wait until the trial is about 20 to 30% mature uh, as far as deaths to, to look at the data. That number, um, don't quote me on that, but um, it'll be a year or two before this is looked at. Uh, patients and investigators remain blinded this is really, really important. So while I'm showing you the data as we've looked at it, you know, you know, um, from the computer at the at the at the database, patients still don't know if they're on acetaminophen or placebo or the physicians because the feeling was everyone had been through a year. So if you're on a year and you're on placebo, why switch? You're doing fine. And if you're on a year and you're on acetaminophen, of course you're not going to stop. You're doing fine too. Finish the three years. Now, of course. If there's patient autonomy, if someone wants to come off, they can. But what I've noticed is most people are staying on, but then at the time that they progress, if they progress, we have now added a crossover to this trial. So patients are going to be able to get the drug if they then have metastatic disease. Because again, our ultimate goal is to do the best thing we can for the people with cancer. Next slide. So um, just a little bit of hist history, um, as I mentioned, uh, there had never been any evidence that an EGFR TKI translated into approval or exchange in clinical practice. There was the SELECT trial, the RADIANT trial, I mentioned that to you. You know, there was a clinically meaningful disease-free survival in that trial, but, but um, no, no, and, and the hazard ratio was in the 0 0.7, 0 0.8 range, but nothing significant. The EVAN, Evan trial, erlotinib versus adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, there was a significant DFS improvement in, in that trial. Um, the the CTONG, had a significant uh, 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 benefit, uh, but none of these had shown overall survival. And we're waiting for overall survival now in our study. Next slide. So what about recurrence? I mentioned that as we wait for the overall survival, let's dig down into recurrence. Local uh, versus distant recurrence has an impact on patient outcomes post-surgery. And local regional recurrence is associated with longer post-recurrence survival than disease recurrence. So, um, if you look, one of the things you want to do is prevent brain recurrence. The CNS is a common site of distant recurrence among patients with EGFR non small cell lung cancer receiving TKIs. In the RADIANT study, 37% of the recurrences uh, uh, were in patients with EGFR mutated non small cell lung cancer treated with um, erlotinib. Asimertinib has been shown to achieve clinically significant exposure in the brain compared with other EGFR TKIs and has shown greater penetration of the blood brain barrier. And in the advanced setting, first line acetaminophen have demonstrated superior overall survival and a 52% reduction in risk of CNS uh, progression compared with erlotinib or gefitinib. So we already knew we had a drug that was better in getting into the brain and working on brain metastases. So let's take a look at this on the next slide. So as I told you, 11% of patients in the acetaminophen arm, so look on the left, and you can see 11% in purple, and 46% of the patients in the placebo arm look on the right, 46% in purple, uh, had disease recurrence or death. Either would have been an event. And um, if you then look at how that recurrence is broken up, that's the second, uh, second um, uh, column uh, on, on, on each of the two panels, you'll see that in the acetaminophen arm, 38% of the recurrence was local. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, um, no, excuse me, 38% of the recurrence was distant. That, 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 that makes more sense. And 62% was local. 
that's good. You want you want the recurrence to be local. That can be dealt with with a little radiation or something else. But look at the, uh, the placebo arm. Forty six percent of the patients, so many more of them recurred, and sixty one percent of those were distant, meaning that to other areas. So this is what I believe the isomertinib is doing. It's either having it's having both a cytostatic and a cytotoxic effect, in my opinion. It's killing tumor cells and preventing them from metastasizing to organs that would produce morbidity and hence mortality. Next slide. This is a very nice uh, uh, way to plot the data. On the top line, you have the same 11 versus 46 I just showed you. 11% of patients recurred in the uh, osimertinib arm, 46% of the placebo arm. Where did these recurrences occur? In the lung, 18 versus 6. In the lymph nodes, 14 versus 3. This is all favoring the osimertinib. In the brain, CNS, 10 versus 1. I'm going to dig into this in a second. In the bone, 8 versus 1. So again, even though we don't have the survival data yet, and we'll get that soon, we now have data that morbidity, recurrence in vital organs. And on the next slide, I think I have uh, this in more detail. Here you can see CNS, disease-free survival events. Overall, 45 patients, 6 in the astromertinib arm, and 39 in the placebo arm, even at this early stage, look at that imbalance in CNS events. And then if you go down, and I've highlighted it with a red bar, if you look at CNS recurrence, 1% in the osimertinib arm, but 10% in the placebo arm. And you can see the death rate, 2 versus 6. So by using this drug with that awesome DFS result, part of the uh, reason for that uh, is the brain is uh, protected. Next slide. And then you can do a, uh, you can do a log rank, uh, Kaplan-Meier for DFS with the brain as the initial site of recurrence. And what do you see? You see up top uh, the, uh, the osimertinib arm in, in blue and below the placebo arm, hazard ratio 0.18, 82% improvement. Um, uh, again, still early. We're, we'll, we, all these data are early. It's because it worked so well, we got a result early, but still hazard ratio of 0.18. That means an 82% decrease in, in recurrence in the brain. Uh, very, very compelling data. Next slide. Safety, you know, you never uh, want to tolerate any uh, toxicity in an adjuvant trial, right? Because, you know, the, the, the comparison was placebo. And if you look at this, um, you can see that um, on the top, uh, blue is osimertinib, uh, yellow is placebo. Uh, look down three lines adver on the top, any adverse event leading to death, zero versus one. So that's good. Uh, no, no grade five, no really uh, death events. Then if you look at AEs, the serious adverse events, 16% versus 13%. So really not that much different given that you're giving a drug versus a placebo and inert element. And if you look at AEs leading to discontinuation, 11% versus 4%. Some patients, and I cared for a good number myself, with this drug will have rash or diarrhea or dry skin or fatigue and will want to come off, but, but not many at all. And then uh, some dose reduction as well. You can always take the 80 and have it have the dose, for example. Um, on the next slide, this is a, what we call the tornado plot. And, um, you know, the light blue and the light yellow are grade one and two. Those are low-grade toxicities. Um, Got to be careful as a clinician. I've talked about this a bit over the year. Um, those are considered mild, but you know, for the patient, not always. So you got to remember that these are irritating things in some cases, and one needs to be sensitive to this. But we know how to manage the rash if they get it, or or diarrhea, or dry skin, or fatigue. But you can see that clearly um, the serious adverse events, the grade three or four, you know, things that really do require drug stoppage or you know serious intervention. That's the dark blue. Very few of those you can see. Um, a little diarrhea, uh, paronychia, the nails, the stomatitis. Uh, and um, so really, um, the drug was well tolerated. Grade one, two interstitial lung disease was very worried about that. They were more worried. My colleagues in Japan and China were more worried than I was in the U.S. because that's where they tend to see more of this. It was only reported in 10 patients, 3% uh, in the osimertinib arm, and it was all grade one, two. Nothing, no one died, nothing significantly uh, bad. And then QTC prolongation in 22 patients, 7% in the osimertinib arm and 4% or 1% in the placebo arm. So you look for it, you'll find it, but all, um, all low grade. 
Uh, next slide. So now we're going to get into some uh, uh, more uh, 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 recent uh, updates. So this is a big trial, a lot of things to look at. So Dr. Yi Lang Wu at the World Lung Conference in Singapore, another meeting that I did from my computer here at my desk at my home in New Haven, Connecticut, um, presented um, the uh, uh, deep dive uh, for post-operative chemotherapy use and outcomes. So um, I'm going to show you just very quickly some of these data. Next slide. So what he did and what we did is we looked and overall 410 out of the 682 patients or 60% received adjuvant chemotherapy for a median duration um, of um, uh, four cycles, which is pretty consistent with what we do worldwide. The majority of patients received platinum-based therapy, all but one. Adjuvant chemotherapy use was more frequent if you look down in patients who were less than 70 years and in patients enrolled in Asia, uh, and was not influenced by performance status. So I was surprised uh, they gave a little bit more in Asia. Um, I, I wasn't surprised that a little bit more was given in the uh, younger patients. But look, the important thing is stage 1B, 26%. That makes sense. Uh, I often will not give it in a 1B patient. Stage 2, 71%. You know, most stage 2 patients get it, but some, some have reasons that they can't or, or by choice. But 80% of stage 3A. So as expected, with a higher stage, more chemotherapy. Next slide. This is really critical. So these are Kaplan-Meier curves on the left without adjuvant chemotherapy and on the right with, I'm sorry, on the left with adjuvant chemotherapy and on the right without adjuvant chemotherapy. And what do you see? In both cases, massive separation between the curves. Uh, the landmark uh, with adjuvant chemotherapy, 89 versus 49% uh, at two years. Uh, without adjuvant chemotherapy, 89 versus 58% uh, at two years. There's obviously some differences in the demographics of these two groups. Um, the group without adjuvant chemotherapy probably with the earlier stage uh, and, and, and better prognosis disease. So keep an eye, keep in mind that's, that's mixed into these data. But the hazard ratio is 0.16 on the left and 0.23 on the right. So still an 84% improvement with adjuvant chemotherapy and a 77% improvement uh, with out. Next slide. And here you can see, um, just looking at um, DFS in patients with and without adjuvant chemotherapy by stage, the overalls uh, shown up top. Um, I've already gone through that with adjuvant chemotherapy on stage two and 3A, 0.14, without adjuvant chemotherapy, 0.15. So that, 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 that's interesting. We'll have to dive into that. It's not, it's not a lot of patients. Um, stage 1B, most of those patients did not have adjuvant chemotherapy, so we're just showing the group without adjuvant chemotherapy, 0.38. If you look at stage 2, with adjuvant chemotherapy, 0.15, without adjuvant chemotherapy, 0.2. So again, these numbers are small, uh, but, but, but uh, some, are, some even ask, you know, can we even get rid of the chemotherapy? We'll have to wait for the data to mature more uh, to, to see that. Right now, I would advise continuing to give chemotherapy if you feel it's indicated. Stage 3A disease with adjuvant chemotherapy, 0.13, without adjuvant chemotherapy, 0.10. So a clinically meaningful DFS benefit without somertinib was observed in patients with or without adjuvant chemotherapy, regardless of stage. Next slide. And um, uh, here you can see the 1B data with and without. I already sort of went over that. In the, in the 1B, it's still way too small numbers. Um, with adjuvant chemotherapy, the same much without adjuvant chemotherapy, the results are quite clear. Next slide. Now we're going to have stage two. Um, clearly, both groups um, with benefit. Stage three. Some people like to look at curves. I actually am one of those. Next slide. Stage three A. Again, you know, you always would see your biggest difference in the in the in the stage of disease that's at most high risk. Uh, 0 0.13 versus 0 0.1. Uh, next. So finally, uh, before I end, and I'm looking forward to some discussion time here with all of you, uh, what about patient reported outcomes? Uh, Asimertin is adjuvant chemotherapy in patients with resected EGFR mutated non-small cell lung cancer. Patient reported outcomes are important. How do the patients feel? They were giving patients three years of a pill that they wouldn't have to take, albeit with very few side effects, but not with none. 
And there's also the whole, you've got to take the pill. You've got to think about it. You know, there, there are things that can affect a patient's quality of life and we need to be cognizant of that. So on the next slide, just very briefly, we, we, we um, and this is a tour de force and I want to thank my colleagues and uh, you know, my, my, the investigators, their staff, you know, it's our staff that works so hard. And then of course, the company AstraZeneca to do this quality of life survey in all these different languages. And this was uh, what's called uh, the SF36. Uh, and it has physical components and mental components. It's basically a survey. And you can see down below uh, the collection period. It was, got, it was collected at, at the time of surgery or chemotherapy, pre-randomization week 12, 24, and then every 24 weeks, patients got a survey, questions to ask about their physical and mental health. It's both, of course. Next slide. And, you know, not much to say. I'm, I'm not an expert in this area, I'll admit, but I've, um, I've uh, gone through these data many times. Good compliance. Tails off a little bit toward the end, as do most projects. But for the most part, um, 80 to 90% or more, uh, uh, you know, uh, per, uh, persistence, perseverance in getting these data. Next slide. And then if you look at the time to deterioration of symptoms, you can see uh, that um, during the disease-free period, the majority of patients did not experience a clinically meaningful deterioration. So um, be careful when you say clinically meaningful. This is, a, this is a test that's been done over years and there, are, there were some slight differences, but they didn't cross the threshold as being what was felt you know, with patient surveys to be of clinically, clinically meaningful. Of course, there were a few more people who had issues with the drug versus placebo, but really, um, for those patients who had deterioration, there were no differences um, between osimertinib and placebo. So really, um, very, very minor differences, uh, which I was very relieved to see. And then on the next slide, I'm getting to the end here, um, we really um, uh, can just summarize. So I'll give you two summary slides and then open it up. Azure and osimertinib is the first targeted agent in a global trial to show a statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in disease-free survival in patients with stage 1B, 2, or 3A, EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer. Overall, there was an 80% reduction in the risk of disease recurrence or death with osimertinib. Disease-free survival has a ratio of 0.2. Osimertinib versus placebo disease-free survival rates at two years were 89 versus 52%. Adjuvant osimertinib demonstrated a clinically meaningful improvement in CNS disease-free survival compared with placebo. And the safety profile was consistent with the established safety profile of osimertinib with mild EGFR TKI class effects reported, meaning duration of exposure was 22 months. Next slide. A clinically meaningful benefit was observed in patients with or without adjuvant chemotherapy, 0.6 versus 0.23, 84% benefit versus 77% benefit, regardless of disease stage. Overall, health-related quality of life was maintained with adjuvant osimertinib treatment with no clinically meaningful differences versus placebo. And adjuvant osimertinib uh, will provide a highly effective practice-changing treatment for patients with stage 1B, 2, and 3A, EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer after complete tumor resection. So with that, I'll just show you my last slide. Um, I, I, I apologize, it was gonna be acknowledgements of all the patients, the investigators, um, the company. This was really, a true multimodality effort, surgeons, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, everyone working together. And I'll thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roy. This was a fantastic exposition of uh, such meaningful data on early lung cancer. Since we are a little behind schedule and since you're already also a part of the panel, we'll move on to the panel discussion and the questions will come then. So may I uh, introduce uh, my dear friend, Dr. T. Raja. He's Director of Medical Oncology at Apollo Cancer Center in Chennai. He's Principal Investigator in so many international clinical trials. And uh, I must remember to tell you that he's a gold medalist uh, for DM Medical Oncology from Gujarat University. So Dr. Raja, over to you. And I believe that all your panelists are there, except that uh, Dr. Uh, Arvind Kumar could not be there, and his place has been taken by Dr. Bilal bin Asad. So, Raja, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Parvish. Thank you so much. This is a great honor 
to be here with um, this such illustrious panel and uh, such a very very uh, you know um, illuminating lecture from professor roy yes, it's a privilege to hear the the principal investigator of the adora trial himself for presenting the data allow me to share my slides yes so um, thank you for this opportunity we you uh, know we heard from the earlier discussion from all the presenters that uh, you know our focus is on early lung um, cancer but then we know that early lung cancer are all not the same and the five year overall survival which is the overall survival is the holy grail um, you know uh, remarkably drops uh, drops from stage 1 uh, once you travel down to the stage 2 to stage 3 to see so much so that when you reach stage 3 you see 41 24 and 12% as five year overall survival from 90s in the stage 1 so a very steep quick decline is noticed and this is again you know illustrated in this picture and you see that even from stage 1 a3 the five year overall survival begins to drop below 80 and as soon as you reach stage 2 it is 60 down so clearly something needs to be done for early lung cancer um so that uh, we can somehow improve the overall survival in the so called early stage disease so, so my question first would be always to uh, you know the, the people who see the lung cancer first the surgeons uh, dr pramesh you know very nice to have you here uh, may i know or in your perception what is the percentage of uh, patients that you see in you know in stage 1 2 and 3 uh, dr pramesh uh, thank you dr raja uh, and uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation so uh, typically uh, we see close to uh, 2100 patients with lung cancer annually at the tata memorial and we operate about 140 so you can do the math yourself so it's somewhere close to uh, 7 to 8% which are operable the vast majority being either in 3b or 4 and a smaller number being uh, stage 1 to 3a but uh, medically inoperable for other reasons so clearly the uh, uh, problem is not something of uh, uh, of optimizing treatment but one of uh, early detection and uh, picking these diseases early than what we do now certainly i mean it's such a large institute your data i mean that will be the picture that will be across the country at least in our subcontinent uh, dr belal um, you know um, assuming that we see a patient apparently in an early stage lung cancer and um, you know how would you stage the patient do you insist on clinical staging or you always want a compulsory pathological staging uh, dr belal you have to unmute yourself dr belal yeah thank you so much uh, uh, for having me here today and uh, as far as the clinical staging uh, is concerned For early stage lung cancer, we will always do a clinical staging, but definitely combine with uh, some form of invasive uh, uh, pathological staging of the lymph nodes. So that is almost always the case uh, uh, with us. Yeah. So I mean, why would why 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 would one need a invasive staging compulsory? So 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 what has happened? And we have seen that in our experience. several times uh, we have seen on pet scan there have been nodes which uh, uh, are being picked up as uh, either mildly fdg avid or fdg avid and uh, many a times uh, it is not surprising when we go in uh, by various methods of uh, sampling them they either come out as reactive granulomatous and maybe not uh, you know cancer and so many of these patients who are otherwise labeled as uh, non operative particularly if the nodes are on the opposite side uh, we have in our experience uh, several times gone in and remove those nodes and prove them to be uh, you know sort of uh, a negative and then only proceed so i think uh, pathological staging in our country is very very important uh, uh. certainly dr deepak you presented you know a, a wonderful lecture um, can you try to add on to whatever uh, surgeon dr belal said uh, regarding why it is important to think about uh, um, e bus e us and and as you pointed out uh, a combo of both uh, one another novelty so can you talk about dr dr deepak 
Thank you, Dr. Raja. I think uh, Bilal has uh, said it very correctly, you know, in, in Indian circumstances, and as I also quoted the data, that uh, FTG AVID could be old granulometers disease, and that actually changes the perspective if we do only a uh, PET scans uh, based staging. So hence, too, in Indian situation, I suppose in particular, we need to prove that the uh, tissue, that it is really whether uh, metastatic disease or it is just an old granulometers disease or a reactive lymph node. And in fact, we, we get this granulometers disease so, so often in these patients who would otherwise be denied on the basis of a PET CT scan. Only uh, drawback of uh, EVAS to in, in this situation is that some of the lymph nodes may not be uh, approachable, which might be approached through the esophagus. But uh, esophagus approach will require a gastroenterologist. And if you have to run to two uh, you know, different centers or two different specialities and to get two separate procedures to make the things a little simpler for them, the, the pulmonologist started using the same EBUS scope uh, through the esophagus, and that is EUSB. And combining this actually, uh, you know, uh, upstages 10% more lymph nodes, uh, which could not be sampled by one. And it has been already shown that adding EUS to EBUS definitely leads to an increase in number of lymph nodes which can be picked up. And perhaps this would be one of the, the uh, combined procedure which is, uh, uh, which is looking at all the lymph nodes. But what you need to do is actually to look at the lymph nodes which are on the other side, as Bilal said, which will make this patient inoperable. And also, which are, uh, uh, you know, the nodal stations, which are state changing. So I think, uh, you know, a systematic approach on the basis of a PET CT report is something which is direly needed. And especially if in other situations in the West, where they are looking for a normal mediastinum to be staged by EBUS in an India, I think more important is every no nodal station being picked up or on a CT or a PET CT scan needs to be confirmed that it is a malignant disease before going ahead and thinking of alternative options of chemotherapy for these patients who otherwise would be surgical candidates, which is so uncommon in real practice for us but these are the things which we need to see and uh, not to miss the opportunity of these patients to be, to be operated upon during that golden period when it is yet possible, but, because, but, but could have been denied on the basis of PET positivity. Thank you, Dr. Deepak. Uh, very, very you know, succinct points. Uh, Dr. Pramesh, you know, what is this called occult N2, which is, uh, and then uh, when, you, when you try to, operate your patient, do you always first approach the mediastinum and then take it forward? How do you approach, a, a, let's say, a stage one and a stage two patient? Uh, Dr. Pramesh? I think he got, got called for an emergency. Dr. Belal? Yeah, so um, in our um, yeah, practice, we would always uh, confirm a negative uh, EBUS report uh, uh, just before the surgery. So we will order, always address the mediastinum. Uh, by a mediastinoscopic evaluation and then proceed with the surgery. Uh, and that has been our practice uh, in uh, majority of the cases. And it is not unsurprising that in certain percentage of cases, sometimes you do find that even with an EBUS negative uh, uh, and clinically negative, occasionally you may find a positive lymph node, which may you know, change the approach uh, uh, of, of the treatment. So would you agree that if, if there is a normal mediastinum on the CT, but there is a positive PET, you don't need a mediastinoscopy, but if you have a negative PET, you need a media. I mean, okay. Would you agree? Sorry, I, I, could you repeat the question, sir? I mean, can you agree on this kind of uh, summarization that if there is a normal mediastinum on a, on a CT and uh -huh. a negative PET, you don't need to do a, a, a scopy? Uh, both being negative. Yeah, so that 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 would be only for uh, peripheral lesions less than three centimeters in size and are not hyalur. Uh, so if there is any lesion which is uh, more than three centimeters in size or is it higher, uh, then I would definitely still go for a mediastinoscopic evaluation. Certainly. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll move on to a couple of cases. Sure. A few cases that I have. And this patient funnily came to us as a possible preform fossa disease and with a possible lung met or a lung mass. That's how it came. So you can look at this picture. And basically there was something suspected in the piriform fossa, which was clinically and then scopy, everything, you know, laryngoscope, all was negative. 
and was noted to have something in the lung. And uh, that's the lung picture. And then we went on to uh, elaborate on the lung. And this is finally what we have on the lung. The lung had a 2.4 into 1.4 centimeter uh, mass in the right side uh, uh, with, with the hilar lymph node, to cut it short. Uh, T1C, N1, stage 2B is what we had on this patient. So my question to you, Dr. Belal, is how would you approach this patient? So T1C um, uh, and stage uh, N1. So this uh, appears to be, a, uh, to me, would be a perfectly suitable candidate for a, a surgical resection, except that uh, one needs to, uh, to prove uh, that the, it is an N2 negative disease. So what I would do is uh, you, I would get an EBUS uh, evaluation, EUS, and uh, the, the advantage with EBUS and EUS is if you get a positive answer, the patient is you know sort of saved from the surgical morbidity. Uh, otherwise, if it is an EBUS negative, I would proceed with uh, uh, the mediastinoscopy and go for lung resection. Fine. Are there any newer surgical techniques that kind of improves your lung resection, so-called? Is that uh, something that you want to speak about? So, so improvement of lung resection in terms of reduction of the morbidity, of course, minimal invasive methods are now being uh, uh, very commonly employed. In fact, for early stage lung cancer, uh, uh, video-assisted thoracic surgery uh, and VATS resection is considered to be uh, more and more useful and uh, slowly becoming the standard of care. In fact, most of the people, uh, and in our center, majority of our lung cancers, uh, early lung cancers are being performed by minimal invasive method only, so which re reduces the morbidity significantly and uh, helps us in the management of these patients. Thank you, Dr. Belal. I'll move on to the medical oncologists. Uh, you know, this patient has been operated. It's a stage 2A, otherwise uh, um, very clear. Nothing much is, uh, you know, there were no other, um, you know, um, uh, there were no other molecular analysis done on this patient. So, Dr. Prabhat, if you are there, um, would you consider this patient for adjuvant chemotherapy? Uh, yeah, if uh, uh, there's a lymph node positive, these patients uh, should be considered. For, I mean, that has been the practice so far that these patients should be considered for a platinum-based tablet for at least uh, three to four cycles. Uh, uh, patients who are known negative, generally, the, uh, the consensus has been keeping a criteria of around four centimeter of the primary tumor size uh, as a cutoff beyond which we uh, generally consider for adjuvant chemotherapy. Dr. Navneet, uh, you know, uh, if you are there, you know, the meta-analysis, uh, the LACE meta-analysis, um, also kind of, you know, numerically, yes, positive, but the five-year overall survival benefit with platinum doublet was only 5.4. Um, so what is your comment on what kind of patients would you choose for adjuvant chemotherapy, Dr. Navneet? All right, so as Prabhat said, anything which is stage two or higher based on pathological staging, and uh, if you have... 1P with 4 centimeter or higher, uh, you would consider for adjuvant uh, therapy. And obviously, th there is a stage migration when you start doing st staging with the 8th edition compared to the 7th because each centimeter matters in the 8th. So that way, it would automatically fit into something which qualifies for adjuvant therapy. One also needs to remember that in the current uh, TNM staging data collection, which we are participating, they are also trying to look at the prognostic influence of uh, something which is not yet part of routine, that is presence of uh, lymphatic or vascular invasion, perineal invasion, uh, and uh, whether it was an R1 or R0 or an R2 resection. Those are not yet used for uh, deciding treatment as per recommendations, but they are likely to be very important. And once we have the ninth TNM data analysis, this is likely to shed light further. Certainly, yeah, we do. I mean, there are some clinical decisions based on you know, those parameters also. But the question to you is that do you routinely test now with the advent of the Adora data? Would you ask for mutation analysis in an early stage lung cancer? Um, so, I mean, we would ask for testing uh, whether we end up using OC Martinib or not is entirely a big debate. I'm no, having... it's a question about your, your practice now. Yes, so uh, I... Yeah, tested... More than six to eight months from the 2020 presentation by Professor Vajas. Do you do? That's all I'm asking. Right, so if it is a resected NSCLC, we would, and it's an adeno, we would ask for testing. Even if it's an NOS, we would still ask for testing. 
Dr. Prabhat, are you routinely asking uh, for uh, mutation analysis um, in your resected patients? Yeah, so uh, even like uh, when we were not uh, using uh, adjuvant DKI, even, we were, even at that time we were doing um, uh, uh, EGFR testing in these patients because this information uh, is quite useful uh, when we have this in advance from the resected specimen uh, and we, can, uh, we could have used this at the time of disease recurrence. Obviously, it makes more sense to do it uh, now because you have much more. You are, uh, you, you are doing or you want to do it. Yeah. Is that the right way to say? Okay. We'll ask Professor, uh, Professor Roy, uh, Professor, excellent lecture once again, but uh, my concern is that most of the guidelines still do not seem to be recommending a routine testing, if at all I want to adopt the Adora data. Um, can you clarify on that, Professor Roy? Yeah, I'm not surprised. <clears throat> it's still early. I think the, the drug just became approved in the US the seven, December 18th. And uh, you know, with Project Orbis, you know, a, a few other countries are coming along, and uh, with with approvals, I think we'll see the exchange in testing guidelines. And you know, I would predict, you know, as a medical oncologist having worked in targeted therapies for 25 years, that it's not going to only be the EGFR; it's going to be other molecular abnormalities found early. Because remember, you know, in lung cancer, it's always been the earlier disease that we can cure with chemo radiation with multimodality approaches. So I think with time, and it's even at Yale, you know, now four or five months in, we're, we're now uh, routinely at tumor board uh, every Monday morning. We're saying, do, we, do you have the EGFR testing? So it will come along. I hope that forums like this and our discussion will, will get the, the message out that there are therapies that are, make a difference. You only want to test, of course, in medicine if you're going to use the information. But now we have reasons to use that information. So I predict that, Dr. Raja, that it's going to it's going, to, it's going to hopefully more quickly uh, start to change in the guidelines. Certainly, Professor. But my question to you is that, you know, the concept is right. There is an EGFR mutation and there are some specific drugs. Well, you, you spoke about this, except that you did not present this meta-analysis. Um, you know, um, I mean, uh, my question to you is that why were all these finally did not um, end up on a clinically meaningful uh, you know, endpoint? What happened and why would osimeritinib be different from the other TKIs? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, it's a third generation TKI. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an EGFR mutation specific drug. So it's much more specific. So more, more, more less toxic. Two, um, it gets T790M uh, and also has penetration in the brain. It also has been shown to have more uh, cytotoxic effect as well as a cytostatic effect. Next, we're using it earlier when there's fewer heterogeneity. There's less variability in the tumor. There are fewer new mutations. So my thought is by using a better drug that gets into the brain early, uh, this drug has uh, a chance uh, to not only improve DFS, but overall survival. Now we're waiting on that result. Yes. But in the meantime, you know, we all take care of patients. And you know, when the patient comes back with brain metastases, it's very hard to rescue that. You know, you could do gamma knife, maybe whole brain, but you know, the morbidity is, is quite severe, seizures and other factors. So I would say that right now, uh, this drug appears to be hitting all the bars that it needs to as it moves towards uh, the ultimate survival endpoint. But um, I think this is a better drug. This is the, 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 the best generation drug uh, yet. Thank you, Professor. I'll, I'll ask my Indian colleagues, Dr. Navneet, uh, you know, you heard Professor Roy, but do you think the DFS and the particularly the CNS DFS are, in, are enough to convince you to change your clinical pra practice as of today. What is your take on this, uh, Professor Nalini? Right, so, I mean, for our uh, scenario, I think the biggest uh, determining factor is the cost of therapy. We know that OC Martinib is exorbitantly expensive and patients who are uh, in metastatic disease are not able to afford it. So. Uh, Given that and the fact that we don't have OS data yet, uh, I, I would probably just end up discussing this option with patients, but I am very, very skeptical how many patients would actually end up taking it uh, till we have OS data. What I really feel is that there is biological plausibility. Maybe what we need for our setting is trying something like Jefitinib or Arlotinib in this setting and trying to see that if you use it the way osimertinib was used, 
does it lead to a dfs and os benefit at much lower cost if we are able to prove that then i think it that is something which can really be practice changing yeah fair enough but all the prior trials which we have enumerated uh, i'm including the ctgom uh, did not go there doctor uh, you know prabhat do you uh, don't you think i you know professor roy also spoke about this these kind of unheard of hazard ratios so would that uh, sway you towards uh, um, starting it on if you take the cost away of course uh, 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 certainly there is no question about the efficacy of the drug there is no question about the cns penetration uh, i mean and the results in terms of dfs curve separation are phenomenal uh, there is no doubt and uh, particularly uh, like if you see stage 3 disease where practically 3/4 of your patients are eventually going to come back with metastatic disease uh, i mean uh, this kind of uh, even if there's no overall survival difference uh, i mean uh, it's it's, uh, uh, it's rational to you know even this uh, huge dfs uh, differences uh, justify the use of uh, this drug one can argue like uh, particularly for early stage disease um, maybe one b you can uh, argue this i mean uh, uh, coming back to the point which dr navneet highlighted that uh, maybe in india uh, considering the cost of this treatment we might have to think about using first generation drug i mean uh, this is something which we really don't have answer uh, that is it uh, really the drug only or is the duration of the adjuvant treatment uh, which has made this difference in the ctong trial versus the adora trial in ctong is a one year treatment and you have a mature survival data here what you are looking at is as a three year treatment Uh, practically half of your patients are uh, on uh, still on treatment uh, and uh, you are looking at the uh, dfs difference and it would be more interesting what happens when these three patients they stop the treatment uh, and uh, how these curve uh, uh, separates them Actually, you know, we will we will you know we all agree that there are you know tremendous uh, you know there would be tremendous uh, enthusiasm but there are several criticism for uh, um the 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 adora data sets which we can probably redirect to professor roy uh, i myself want to ask him you know we all know that finally overall survival is the uh, holy grail so therefore why dfs was chosen um you know this these are often repeated criticism towards the adora trial and uh, and then second question is why the three year you know um, duration of osimertinib was chosen where did that come from um you know these are some questions that we have professor roy if you can answer that all, all very good questions you know this um you know don't forget her septin for adjuvant breast tumors was uh, studied with disease free survival as well well over 15 years ago and uh, ultimately approved we actually just did a program a few weeks ago with the FDA uh, in the US it's called uh, living label you can find it online it's an AACR program and they were fully supportive of a disease free survival uh, uh, endpoint an overall survival trial uh, would take a very long time as the primary endpoint this at least gives an early readout and allows more patients to benefit sooner which is of course all of our our goal um sure overall survival is the ultimate endpoint but i would contest that even if that doesn't hit and i don't think that will be the case the benefits to patients in terms of their morbidity are still quite significant and uh, i showed some of that in my data set you know for example with the brain um so um the trials being maintained as best it can for that overall survival uh, number and that's being looked at but i can tell you in the us we are testing I think the NCCN guidelines will probably change soon. Uh this is being used and I I've, I've treated someone already off label on on label off the trial and uh, I know you know it's this is not as common in the US as it is in Asia. So I think you know certainly we're going to want to see this uh, take off throughout the world and I think it will. Now as far as the 3 years is it empiric? Yeah. Uh it's more than 2 years and uh you know and could it be more? I worry about that. I worry that maybe we need to keep treating and one of you said it, we need to look at those landmarks and see what happens. We actually should even be even more sophisticated than that and I want to assure you we are being uh, and we're looking at plasma. And we could actually measure, you know, at the time of surgery, let's look at the plasma and see is there any cell-free DNA? Can we even pick up, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, minimally resistant disease? If we can, can we follow that? Can we follow for early recurrence? 
um, because we do know that these drugs are in some cases cytostatic and there are data, there are published literature for asimertinib that's also cytotoxic. I do think that the longer duration, using it earlier, it's, it's better penetration to the brain. Uh, the fact that you can give it for three years, you know, you couldn't do that with, with uh, a second or a first generation drug, all make a difference. But that's a very valid question and only time will tell. And I think that we'll, we'll continue to see these, these, uh, these data emerge as we, we update the trial in the years to come. But right now, at least it is an expensive drug, but um, the benefits, I, I believe, outweigh that. And when, when we can, we are using it, at least in the United States. Certainly, Professor. One more criticism or, or what happened was as soon as the data was uh, revealed, um, there was immediate uh, hue and cry that, oh, now everybody is going to be unblinded and this whole uh, you know, overall survival data is never going to be there because everybody is going to cross over. So then came the criticism. Then we learned that you are continuing, you are blinding and the patients are continued as it is. So then comes the criticism that uh, is it now that such a superior DFS has been shown, is it ethical to continue the blinding? So I think, you know, there are, uh, there are people who are never satisfied with either way, but can you address that question, Professor? Right. I, I actually, you know, uh, when this came up, you know, we discussed it with patient groups. The first thing I said is, it doesn't matter what we think as investigators, let's see what the patients think. Remember that um, uh, it's unblinded uh, at the level of the data but the patients and the physicians remain blinded, but everyone had already gotten through a year of treatment. So you're a patient, you know, you're getting adjuvant, maybe it's placebo. These data don't say after one year, you should switch over. Um, you know, at one year, if you're doing well, you know, my feeling as a physician would be, don't want, why do anything? It's been one year, the patient's disease free. At this point, you continue to manage that patient, they're on placebo, and then if and should they recur, then they'll have a metastatic situation and then they can get asimertinib you know, in the metastatic setting where it is approved in many places. What we actually did, um, and I think this is, I, I really want to applaud the company for doing this, is everyone now has a crossover. So many of these countries, you can't get the drug that easily. So right now, if someone uh, progresses and they are unblinded and they're on placebo, they now have access to asimertinib and they can get it. Um, on the trial. So we're actually making sure that there is a crossover. Uh, the, the very reverse of what you said, this is going to make sure that the integrity for the survival endpoint is maintained as best as it can be because we're making sure everyone who is potentially a candidate gets it um, on recurrence. Now, I agree that you know patient autonomy, it's the first right of ethics. And uh, if, if a patient comes and says, Dr. Herbst, I wanna come off, I wanna know what I'm on, absolutely. Uh, and and, and they, they'll still have uh, access to the asimertinib later on. Very few people have, have done that, um, but, but, but certainly um, if, we, if someone wanted to come off, they could. But I don't know that I would start asimertinib after a year, year and a half on a patient who's doing well. I'd say you're doing well. You know, tincture of time has already shown that that patient's not going to have an early recurrence. But, um, but, it, but it is certainly something to keep an eye on. I haven't heard a, a, any concerns uh, for the most part, but but if there are any, uh, patients can do whatever they want. Thank you, Professor. I, I, I'll present a case in which exactly, you know, I had a patient who, who presented to me in September 2019, and um, that was actually a doctor, and uh, undergoes, you know, surgery, uh, undergoes the, the lobectomy, and that's the pathology that I have, T1C N0 stage 1A3 and it's logic grade two adenocarcinoma. So she happens to be a doctor and therefore, I mean, uh, she was reading up on all these things and uh, well aware of the, you know, I mean, 2019 end, I was well aware of the emerging data on, so went on to do molecular profiling on her own and she turns out, turned out to be EGFR uh, mutation positive in an exon 19 deletion. So she wanted to know whether she would be a candidate for osimertinib at that time. That was the discussion she came in and asked. And I said, the data is still not ready and we are eagerly looking for the trial. She came back again in May or June, 2020, as soon as uh, your data was presented and asked the same question. I said, no, you are still in uh, one year and I have already waited for you know, nearly six months. So I would sit, sit, sit tight 
and I probably still will not consider you on adjuvant osimertinib. That's what I told the doctor. Um, so, Professor Roy, uh, uh, Professor Herbs, would you agree with that assessment, sir? If the patient comes to us after June 2020, what should I do? Right. So, the patient's already outside the window, basically. Well, there are a couple of things here. Remember, our, our trial was done using staging system seven, and now this is eight. Um, the trial, the, 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 the group in our trial was 1B to, to 3, but there were a few 1As. And actually, in the US, I believe we have the approval for 1A too. Um, in this case, I might have talked to the patient about it at the time of surgery or within 24 weeks or 12 weeks. But at this point, uh, already out six months, I would say, um, you know, we know we have a good drug for you. It's available in, in the worst case scenario, should your disease come back, let's consider to do surveillance. But I probably would not start them after that period of time. Thank you, Professor. But this patient did come back and had a relapse, as you can see in the early March 2021. And we did an EBUS. And still, if there's a local regional disease that was positive for adenocarcinoma, but she did not have metastatic disease, but she was very clear that she wanted to go at this point on adjuvant osimertinib. So I had to yield to that and I agreed to start. Um, that is about uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, do you think, Professor, would you agree at this point to start the patient on osimertinib? Well, at this point, you could probably get away with a little SBRT or something like that for this lesion, right? Was radiation considered? You know, look at the site of the disease, and it's quite, she was very concerned about uh, the radiation effect. She was not willing to go on SBRT. So at this point, you know, um, it's local regional. So it's, um, it, this is not, you know, of course, the trial, but of course, you know, much of what we do is not uh, a trial. It's a uh, real world. Um, I think it probably... Uh, not unreasonable at this point to, to start around the asimertin, I probably would have done that as well. But again, it has to be approved in the setting and reimbursed. You know, that's a, that's a big issue. Yeah, yeah. So I did concerned here and I have agreed to start. And, uh, you know, you, you, we can still see that uh, even in one year, three, the overall survival is only 77% uh, at five years. So there is a probable, you know, case in argument. Um, I'll move on to another case. And uh, this patient is a, a lady, 60 years old, and had a, a 4.5 centimeter right lower lobe mass and had a you know, N2, single station, non-bulky N2. So I'll come back to my, that's, that's the scans. And I will come back to my um, you know, surgeons once again. Dr. Pramesh is back. Um, stage 3A, T2, N2. Single station disease. Uh, Professor Pramesh, how would you approach this patient? So, uh, as you well know, this is one of the most controversial areas in uh, lung cancer treatment. Uh, I don't think there's one right answer to it. Uh, our approach is that if you find an N2 disease, we give new adjuvant treatment followed by uh, surgery. But I wouldn't strongly argue with the surgeon who felt that it was a, if it was a uh, microscopic single station, mediastinal node positive, uh, they could go ahead with uh, uh, upfront surgery followed by chemotherapy. If you ask me, with most of the studies that have been done on neurogen therapy, the benefit has been pretty similar whether you give it uh, pre-chemo or pre-operative or post-operative. The, uh, the NATCH trial is a very good example of that. And I suspect that even in the N2, uh, it might end up uh, with that kind of a result that it doesn't matter whether you give it pre-operatively or post-operatively. Uh, but uh, to me, currently, the strong evidence uh, favors uh, uh, giving new chemotherapy, new adjuvant rather than adjuvant in uh, proven N2 disease. And uh, that's our philosophy. Okay. Thank you, Professor Pramesh. Dr. Belal, you know, you heard Professor Pramesh talking about even 3A possibly approaching in a new adjuvant manner. What about stage 3B? There are some resectable entities in 3B. There are some non-resectable entities in stage 3B. I have a patient I'll present to you, 70-year-old patient, reasonably good, even despite 20 years of uh, smoking, was a hard-working mechanic. And um, the CT's chest pictures are presented here. And, um, uh, and that's the mediastinoscopy picked, I mean, you know, profile PET CT was done. Mediastinoscopy was done. I'll just summarize, these are the PET CT pictures, but I'll summarize that the patient had a T3 and 2 Stage 3B, um, 70, but very fit patient. Uh, Dr. Belal, 
would you really venture to do something surgically on this patient or not? Is Dr. Belal there with us? Professor Pramesh, can you take it? Sure. Uh, though this technically becomes 3B, uh, the earlier classification had this at 3A. And uh, uh, I don't think we have strong evidence to support uh, it one way or the other, whether a new agent therapy followed by surgery approach would be better or a radical chemo radiation approach would be better. And uh, this kind of patient, uh, T3, N2 with uh, uh, a couple of stations being positive, at least at, at our center and probably most other high volume thoracic surgical units would be treated with uh, new adjuvant therapy followed by uh, surgery. Yeah, certainly. I, I'm not presenting the nodal stations here. It's, it's a very, very, and you have talked about the logical steps in this patient, but my point to um, my radiation colleagues, um, you know, uh, we have uh, very, very eminent radiation colleagues here. I mean, is there a role for, uh, um, you know, if, if, if there was a, not a, a good resection, would you consider radiation? What would you talk about radiation in a stage three patient? Uh, Dr. J.P. Agarwal, sir. Uh, thanks, Dr. Raja. I think uh, run of the meal, uh, definitive chemo radiation for cure is achieved, followed by the adjuvant durua, uh, which is coming up. And especially he's 70 years. And definitely I think that would have been considered in the MDT. So this would have been discussed in the MDT, whether which way will be going. And especially when there are multiple nodes, multi-station with extra nodal fuzzy margins, I think this patient would have gone in for chemo radiation. This patient would have gone in for a chemo radiation. Yes. I have another patient. This patient, funnily, presented to us with a, uh, was first diagnosed to have a neuroendocrine tumor of the duodenum. But then uh, that was uh, that was detected when, when the patient was worked up. Look at this, uh, you know, daughter tax scan. We found that the patient has got a lung mass. And this lung mass was, you know, we were worried whether it's a metastatic disease. And we wanted to decide whether we'll go aggressive for the duodenal neuroendocrine tumor. And therefore, we biopsied this lung mass. It turned out to be an adenocarcinoma. So then we, we asked our surgeon, what can they do? They approached, like our surgeon said, they approached, um, you know, funnily there were Dota Avit lymph nodes, Dota negative lymph nodes. So they approached the mediastinum and the whole thing is resected, stage 3B. And uh, I mean, it turns out that the patient has a second malignancy, lung adenocarcinoma, T3 and 2 stage 3B. So we resected, fine. But in case of uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an R1 or R2 resection, is there a role for something called a port uh, and all that? Uh, you know, uh, is Dr. Vijayanda Reddy with us already joined? Or I have to ask Professor Agarwal to answer that question. Professor J.P. Agarwal, sir. Okay. So I think uh, in case of R1 or a R2 resection, Definitely, I think there is going to be advantage. And especially if it is this patient is on the right side and now with modern technology, what we understood in port, there were a lot of deaths because of the radiation probably because of the cardiac damage. And now we understand that uh, cardiac uh, tissues are very sensitive to radiation. So we can definitely protect and give a reasonable dose to the areas at risk with protection of the heart, especially if they are on the right side. So I think I would have considered radiation, something like around 56 to 60 gray in conventional fractionation with conformal technique. Thank you, uh, Professor J. Pair. I'll turn to my pathologist, uh, Professor J. Mehta is here. You know, now that we have renewed interest on pathology and molecular profiling of early stage uh, lung cancer, uh, Professor J. Mehta, what sort of sample you are looking at uh, when you are uh, when you are looking at the early stage lung cancer, you want the whole resected specimen, you want uh, the nodes, or um, are you sometimes happy with uh, doing um, mutational analysis with bronchoscopic biopsies if there was a scenario? So, what do you talk about uh, specimens and mutational analysis, Professor Mehta? If you are there, yeah. Hello. So 
basically we're used to dealing with uh, ct guided core biopsies uh, because as you said you know early stage lung cancer is so uncommon in our country so we're pretty happy with these small tissues if you get more the pathologist is always happy you get to do uh, much more comfortably but the simple thing is yeah, even the small bronchoscopic biopsies are good enough to do mutational testing okay um and uh, you know do you do you follow now do you think that uh, something like a, a reflex testing is good or with the advent of the knowledge that there are so many mutations so it's it is prudent to do a complete ngs and what is your take on that uh, dr mehta so again uh, keeping cost aside if that's not really uh, the hindering block or the stumbling block uh, yes i completely agree it should be reflex and a complete ngs should be done because there are various targets which could really uh, open up with that uh, i mean you can have multiple treatment avenues opening up with uh, several targets in lung tumors now right. uh, of course cost is an hindrance in our setting all the time so that needs to be uh, addressed that's it yeah now i know that i don't have much time so professor roy herbst is there it's a very very you know his presence is so important i want to get the best out of him i want him to address on some of the questions what about the adjuvant iuo trials and the new adjuvant tki tri trials professor herbst well um so the adjuvant io trials um probably will report in the next year or so um you know those of course um are done without a biomarker you know remember what we've talked about today is the best of targeted therapy mutations high risk disease bringing good drugs early um the results uh, are shown in the io setting we know io works in lung cancer uh, in the adjuvant setting without any marker Uh, without any uh, sense of uh, risk or MRD, um, I think it's a 50-50 shot. We'll, we'll see if it works. Certainly, um, we do know that there's residual disease. Uh, will the immune therapy work? We we do know it works in stage three disease based on the Pacific trials after chemo radiation. So that's those are data that makes us feel that there's more promise that it will work there. Um, yeah, as far as the new adjuvant uh, IOs, new adjuvant TKs, what is your uh, what is coming up? Uh, well, Well, the neo adjuvant IOs, you know, um, I don't know if any of you have done it, but the surgeons that I work with are pretty impressed when they see what they pull out after the patient's had a nivolumab or a, a tezolizumab, for example. So I think that that's clearly going to be the case. As far as, but but you know, neo adjuvant therapy is hard. How long do you continue after surgery? I think adjuvant therapy is probably still going to be uh, the the better approach. But as far as the TKIs, um, there is the neo adora trial. which is looking at these drugs before surgery um that of course has great scientific implica implications all the questions that have been asked today how does it work is it set as toxic set as static will be answered there so that's ongoing um and then this is the Laura trial that you're showing now uh, i think this is very important so after chemo radiation if, excuse me if someone has an EGFR mutation do they go on and receive uh uh, uh asimertinib versus going on to immunotherapy Um, there were a few patients on the uh, Pacific trial with EGFR mutations, and they still seem to benefit, but a very, very small number. Um, so these are all open questions. They're going to need larger trials, um, um, and um, I wouldn't make it standard of care yet. Thank you, Professor. My last question uh, to you is that uh, you know we have been looking at the Alchemist trials for a long time. Um, you know what's coming out of you know it seems to be 2015 onwards is going on and on and on. i mean uh, what's coming out of this alchemist trial data can you tell us and what's what's coming up there thank you professor well you, you asked me earlier why we chose dfs for the adora the alchemist chose overall survival uh, the alchemist uh, i believe the alchemist uh, sub study using erlotinib has closed so um it's not going to go forward it was using the earlier generation drug erlotinib and also with uh, uh the asimertinib data and with um uh you know adora positive i believe that that's not ongoing anymore there was a sub study with alk you know you you would ask why couldn't you use an alk inhibitor or a red inhibitor in the same setting i believe that's still ongoing but it's accruing quite slowly um the 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 the, the trial that has accrued quite quickly is the adjuvant in the nivolumab uh in the alchemist and i think that will probably be one of the first uh, readouts for adjuvant immunotherapy uh but those trials are we're looking at overall survival um um uh, but i think the adora you asked why did we use dfs the dfs you know result came early um has resulted in the drug being approved i actually think it's great that if it can be uh, reimbursed 
um, uh, countries uh, around the world will have the chance and patients, more importantly, to get this drug early, prevent metastases to vital organs. And I'm, I'm as anxious as you to continue to follow the trial for survival. And hopefully by the time we have the survival results, I can travel to your country in person uh, to present them. Thank you, Professor. Is Dr. Vijayanda Reddy joined us? Um, if he is there, I can ask him one question. Otherwise, I think I, it's, it's time up. Thank you for this great opportunity, organizers. And I will stop here. And uh, thanks, everyone. Kindly take care. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Raja. My pleasure. Appreciate the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Roy Hurt, uh, Dr. T. Raja, all the panelists, uh, Prabhat, Pramesh, uh, Bilal, Navneet, uh, J.P. Agarwal, Jay Mehta, and uh, we miss Vijayan and Reddy. Uh, we also had two wonderful speakers earlier. I think uh, we've uh, really discussed some vital uh, points for early lung cancer, and we hope that we can do a better job of curing these patients in the future. So once my, more, I thank everybody, uh, both the faculty and the panelists, for making this so interesting. And uh, I wish you all the best. And I hope that uh, Dr. Raja's last slide motivates us to do a better job in the second wave of the COVID that we are facing right now. Take care, be safe, and have a nice day or a good night for wherever you are in, in the world.